All right, welcome back to the Big Apple. We're here at mongodb.local. Come on inside the cube. We are really excited to have Benny Chen here. He's a co-founder of Fireworks AI and Gregory Greg Mason, Maxson, excuse me, MongoDB, global lead of AI GTM. That's go to market. Greg, Benny, good to see you. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Okay, first question. Why, I always love to ask co-founders and founders this question. Why'd you start the company? Well, I asked myself, if not with this team, then with who? And I had no one else. I, like, I respected Lynn and Dimitro so much that I was like, I'm going to go for it. Okay, so you really didn't have an idea as to what problem you were going to solve at that point. You just knew you'd figure it out. Is that right? Uh, we had some idea. We knew, like, we were like a bunch of PyTorch veterans. So we knew that people out there need a lot of help on PyTorch. Uh, exactly how we didn't really figure out completely. And honestly, when we founded the company, ChatGPT wasn't out yet. So we had to pivot uh, somewhere in the middle as well. So tell us what you do, what, what the company's focused on. So Fireworks is a uh, inference provider that helps people uh, serve the open source models. And we also serve proprietary models, like we help stability and upstage. We also pr help with inference uh, uh, on fine tuning as well as embedding, so then business can, can really control the LIMs and productionize those cases. And and you all are sort of meta DNA, and right? And meta, uh, you came out of meta, and, and you got, <laughs> meta likes to build stuff. So it's interesting to me that you're partnering with Mongo, because Mongo's all about making things simple, right? You guys like hard things typically, but so why Mongo? What's, what's that partnership about? Uh, so no, no more, I, I, I do see that Mongo is actually one of the kind of the most sophisticated database providers. Uh, so I, I, that, that part, I, that, that part actually I, I think is very, that has strongly resonated with me uh -huh. because it's very easy to use. And at the end of the day, we want developers to be able to leverage these tools. Uh, we want to work with providers who enable and empower developers. And that's one of the secret source for PyTorch. Back then, it wasn't the most powerful, uh, most efficient uh, model framework, but it was the most easy to use. And then the developers are gravitated towards the things that's easy to use, and then we can figure out the performance and all that stuff later. I don't know if Greg had- It added value to it, yeah. That says, you have a, anything to add there, Greg? Yeah, we, we really valued the partnership with Fireworks. We feel that together, they create a complete offering for, for our developers. And that's where we're just obsessed thinking about is what's the full end-to-end -end stack that they need to be successful. And so the services that Fireworks provides around inference, around fine-tuning, combined with your proprietary data being easily accessible with MongoDB is why we think this is such a great, perfect fit uh, partnership for our customers. And the big news here, MongoDB uh, announced its AI app program, MAP. I think actually announced it er earlier this week. How How's that fit in to the partnership? Sure, I think it's a, a perfect extension of the work we were already doing with Fireworks. The reason we wanted to partner with Fireworks was because they were highly complimentary. We thought about what are all of the needs our customers have? We solve some of them, but we don't solve the other parts. And Fireworks comes in as that perfectly complimentary component. However, there's a lot of other parts to the stack that a developer would need in order to build a modern AI application. And so we wanted to provide that complete stack to our customers. What we were hearing from our customers was this market's moving so fast. It's changing so quickly that it's hard for me to keep pace. It's hard for me to, I find it overwhelming to know how to get started. And I oftentimes don't have the in-house expertise to integrate and implement all of these things. So I need a trusted advisor to help show me what's the full stack I need. What does great look like? What's worked? And that's what MAP is intended to provide, is that comprehensive set of offerings. And we're really excited that Fireworks was uh, an integral launch partner as part of that. In a recent survey with our, e our partner ETR, it was a New York-based um, data platform, and they do a lot of surveys. Uh, uh, it was surveys about 1,800 uh, IT, predominantly CXOs and IT decision makers. 20% said they're not doing any, pursuing any Gen AI. And I, when I saw that number, I said, why? You got to be kidding me. Everybody's doing Gen AI. And when we dug into the data and we talked to some of these folks, they said exactly what you just said. You know what? It's moving too fast. It's actually too risky for us. So we're going to sit back. I, I, I like it. It's a, 
the Forrest Gump, Bubba Gump shrimp when the hurricane came in and wiped out everybody and then they were left. We're going to wait and see where all the damage is and then we're going to come in. But that's per perhaps not the best strategy because you could be left behind. So if I understand it correctly, you would obviously appeal to those folks and also help accelerate those that aren't quite seeing the ROI out of the chatty use cases. Is that a fair assessment? I think that's right. Uh, we've heard that same problem. We've heard it's really hard to get started. That first mile feels overwhelming. And, but a lot of companies also recognize that it's a very much disrupt or be disrupted period right now. And so there's a lot of risk with waiting and being on the sideline and saying, okay, in a year, we'll come back and see if the water's warm. Um, and so we wanna alleviate some of that risk and make it easy to get started, show proven repeatable reference architectures, give the best parts of the stack, help provide the expertise and professional services to make sure all of these parts of the stack work well together and implemented. Um, and hopefully that helps bring down your 20% number to a much lower number so that everyone knows they can get started and it's not as daunting as they might think it is. But the other part of that equation, which is perhaps more interesting is aligning with the 80% because 80% are doing stuff. But when you ask them what they're doing, it's tech summary, you know, it's, it's, it's code generation, um, it's chat, it's a basic stuff that's nice and it's actually quick ROI, but it's not a big net present value. It's not a big chunky revenue driver. So I'm trying to understand where you guys fit, how you can help that sort of that, that eight, not only that 20% that aren't doing anything, but that 80% who want to take the next step and do more you know, value oriented work. Yeah, I think for fireworks, we serve two really big sets of use cases that helps to add value. The one is what I would categorize as co-pilots, where the model need to think as fast as you type or think as fast as you speak. So in those cases, we are very low latency. We're very good at serving things at production as a stable, highly available. Uh, so those cases, uh, we will do well with very small models that already exist today. I think what's yet to happen is you need the assistant that shows up every day that helps you do your day-to-day -day work. And the models are just not there yet. And I think it's up to us and the people in the industry to help push forward to get to a place where the model is smart enough to actually answer your emails, right? And at that point, we will have model that runs more slowly. We'll have more agents that's running the system on your behalf. But then that, I think, has to happen later on in the next few years. So, it's, Benny, this is a model problem, not so much a, a data problem, or is it a combination? I think it's a combination. And also, I think on top of that, there has to be frameworks like agents uh, and people uh, set up those agents correctly to be able to do your day-to-day -day job. Uh, for us, I don't know, like whenever I come into a new job, I get yelled at for like two weeks at least before I can actually do the job. And the yelling that has to happen to the model, right? Like it's the data training, it's the guardrails, it's the agents that's put in place to get the model to behave the way you want it to behave before it can actually do the job. So the developers are actually the most interesting part of the puzzle here. They need to be empowered to build these things and you'd be empowered to put these models the way they actually help you do the work. And we are here to help the developers. Well, and of course, again, this scares people. This is where governance comes into play because, you know, automobile manufacturer A releases a, 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 a rag or a chatbot and it recommends the competitor's truck. You know, you've seen things like that. Or we've seen, you know, people being able to prompt engineer and, and get a better price, actually get something for a dollar that really should have cost, you know, thousands of dollars. So we've seen those types of, of, of you know, corner cases. So governance is a huge, huge concern. And we always talk about guardrails and things like that. Um, I'm interested in both of how are you guys helping solve that problem? Presumably that's part of what Mongo is delivering with this curated set of LLMs and tools. And then I'm curious if you guys can help the problem. Why don't you start? Yeah, definitely. We recognize the challenge with that. I think there's so much uncertainty still and, and skepticism around the ability for AI to function exactly as intended. And that's a big portion why we think the data is such an important component of it, because the models that you're building, the applications that you're building that are enriched with AI need to be grounded in your proprietary data. They need to be talking the way your brand voice talks. They need to follow your corporate guidelines. And right now, if you're just using generic models and not grounding it in your data, then you're going to get generic responses that don't align with the way that your organization 
would want to operate and would traditionally train you know thousands of people to operate on but now can be automated so that's why we believe that it hasn't yet come to fruition as much as we think it will but your proprietary data is such an important component in ensuring that ai reflects like your brand wants to be reflected in these modern applications but did you guys help solve that governance issue and, and if so how i think one key point we help with is speed and with fast inference you can also enforce these rules uh, in the in the LM form and ask the LM whether if I was a sales agent from MongoDB, am I adhering to the corporate policies and am I am I being warm? Am I being welcoming? And those things, LM is actually really good at assessing content. So if you're fast for inference, you can sneak in those guardrail components by asking the LM whether you're doing these things right. Uh, and with faster speed, you can sneak in more and more of these guardrails. And eventually, with enough guardrails in place, you could be able to have these agents uh, representing your company. But it would take a while. So thinking about Dave's three layers, he talks about the infrastructure layer, the training and tools layer, and then the apps layer. I'm curious as to how you guys see the future of applications. Obviously, the AI plays a role, uh, a shift in activity from training to inference. You've got GPUs, CPUs, NPUs, A6, uh, uh, LPUs now, all kinds of specialized processors uh, that are super powerful that application developers can take advantage of. If I asked you in 1999, what's the future of apps look like? And you said, oh, you look at Salesforce, they're doing you know, SaaS or cloud or you know, cloud-based, they're really not cloud at the time. We weren't using that term but software as a service, you'd point to that, but Salesforce wasn't the future of apps. They, 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 they kind of predated cloud and mobile. So you look at Salesforce today, it's kind of like not the greatest mobile experience, but it survived. But the future of apps was what you see in social media, what you see like Uber. So with that as this long-winded background, how do you guys envision the future of apps? Maybe you could start, Benny. Yeah, I think the first thing is the set of copilots are going to proliferate. Right now, a lot of copilots are in your uh, coding environments. They're probably also in your uh, like uh, photo editors, things like that. A lot of tools will get up leveled for more copilot use cases. So then, it's not so difficult to use these tools, right? Like if I have to change the hue and saturation for this photo, I have to go into this drop down and remember that, oh, these are the set of things I need to change for this set of photos. Those are just way too difficult for human to remember and Copilot will help with those. I think the second set of things will be, uh, for lack of better words, like agents. So like, for me, honestly, it's like if one day I can email something and it comes back with satisfactory results, then that has passed the uh, agent test for me, right? I, it doesn't happen yet. And eventually, like those, we may or may not call them applications, but things that I would imagine I can email with. Yeah, they're, but they're, they're business impact activities, right? How do you see this? I bet you in the flywheel between what Mongo's doing, this whole partnership uh, strategy and, and the developer community that you have, how that will lead us into the future in your, in your vision, Greg. Yeah, when, when we think about the future of apps, I mean, I think they're going to be highly iterative. The, there isn't a future app. It's going to be incremental in nature. Um, but we expect to see significantly better personalization so that apps aren't going to be ger generic, one-size-fits-all experiences for everyone. I mean, think about a retail experience today. If you're on the, the Nordstrom app or something like that, you go through a click down and you select men's clothing and you select jackets and you get this nice blazer that you have on and you have to search through 50 pages of blazers to find something you like. However, if you have in the future some autonomous agent on there and you say, hey, I'm going to Paris in April for a wedding and the dress code is this and then here's my background of things I purchased, here's what I look like, here's what I like some recommendation can be highly personalized to exactly who you are, how much you want to spend, where you're located, when you need it, what the weather's going to be in Paris at that time, all of these other details that previously you would have just had to go through your own discovery process. There's so many different ways in which that can show up. 
And I think we talk about apps and you think about an app on your phone, but then there's also apps for a business. Think about a major consulting firm. How do I build some sort of application so that my consultants don't have to spend hundreds of hours thinking through what's the right customer experience workflow for a telco in South America based on all the diligence we've done historically. Comb through all of that information and build me a deck. That's an app for, for a different type of user. And so no matter who your customer is, whether it's an internal employee looking for information about the company, whether it's a consumer, whether it's a B2B, there will be all of these applications that will make people smarter, give them better information based on what their specific needs that's are. A good, that's a good vision because today we see glimpses of it. You can go into chat GPT, you can ask it to whatever, you build be a business plan or a, or, a, or a project plan and it'll give you something that's generic. You, you know, it's not that, that great. And then you, but it's helpful. And, and, but you're envisioning a world where the quality of the output is much better. And on the former example, like the consumer examples, I take my, my takeaway there is you're talking about personalization at scale, mass, highly customized experience, but at scale. So my question is come, coming back and I presume it's high quality speed. That's the role that you guys play, correct? Yes, yes, yes. And talking about personalization, so I used to work at Meta for as recommendations. Um, a lot of our colleagues also came from recommendation type of uh, workload before. And the recommendation we used to serve are, given a set of inventory, how can I find things that is interesting for you? I think what will be changing is the inventory itself may also be AI generated. And we there could be cases where businesses can identify things that people are interested in, but doesn't yet exist. And then use AIs to fill those inventories. And I think that's probably gonna be uh, where a lot of changes are, like especially for social networks and for video sites uh, in the next few years. How do you, how do you think about, so in the MAP program, um, there's some curated set of LLMs. Uh, we saw Anthropic on stage. Um, we, we, uh, Llama 3, I'm pretty sure is in there. Uh, I think Cohere, I saw Cohere, is there, there and there. Okay, so that's cool. Um, are you comfortable with Mongo's choices? Do you, do you wish they had, if Dave were right here, would you want him to add another one? What do you, what's your take on all this? Uh, I, it was, I, I think it was like Warren Buffett's quote or something like, if Yao Ming works into the bar, you don't ask if he's tall or not. You just recognize he's tall. <laughs> like if someone's tall, you just recognize he's tall. And we strive to be the best. And one day if we are like Yao Ming, we're like, oh, we walk into the bar and like this is one of the best LM providers. Then we achieve our goal. And I think like Mongo should definitely pick, pick and choose whatever that's best for, our cost, for, the, for the customers. We're here to get the developers to the, to the stage where they can productionize uh, the applications. And honestly, like, as long as we're on that path and how Fireworks is helping people on that path, like yeah. Yeah, Fireworks, should, uh, Fireworks should just be part of the choice. But, like Mongo should pick and choose, yeah. You don't feel limited by Mongo's choices, uh, it's just clear. <laughs> All right, Greg, I'll give you the last word on mongodb.local2024. Uh, takeaways from the show, anything you want to say about the partnerships? Yeah, we're, we're really excited about all the partnerships that we're bringing to life here. I think it shows amazing momentum uh, as part of the MAP program. We had 15 great launch program partners, um, but we're really just beginning in this journey and, and it's all about helping our customers be successful. We recognize that we're super early in this stage of AI development. And uh, we're really excited to bring some of these experiences to life with our partners like Fireworks over the next year. Well, we're excited, too, to be covering this. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Benny, Greg, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Thank you. Okay, keep it right there. We'll be back. Suraj Patel is coming up. He's the head of MongoDB Ventures, and we're going to be featuring a company called Nomic. Keep it right there. You're watching theCUBE at MongoDB Local from New York City. Right back.